Hello and welcome to Meet the Candidates. I'm Carrie Steele. I'm the midday host on iHeartRadio's Coast 103.5 in Los Angeles. And joining me today, California State Assembly member representing the 43rd District, or now is it 44? Now it's 44. Okay, but you were elected to the 43rd District. Laura Friedman is with us today. Welcome to Meet the Candidates, Ms. Friedman. Thank you for having me. Call me Laura, please. I'm happy to. Thank you. And we should start by clarifying this is Meet the Candidates. Uh, You are the Democratic candidate running for U.S. House of Representatives in California's 30th Congressional District. I want to be accurate. That's absolutely right. (laughs) Awesome. Okay, so you are representing several L.A. communities, um, Silver Lake, Burbank, Glendale, Hollywood, parts of several other communities. I don't want to gloss over that. I want to make sure. Yeah, Sunland, Tahunga, West Hollywood, Mid-City, Larchmont, all of those areas. So from West, West Hollywood through the L.A. Basin and then Glendale, Burbank, and Sunland, Tahunga. Okay, you know... Since you mentioned Hollywood, I do want everybody to know, because it's Meet the Candidates, uh, before a career in politics, a film producer. Was it 2009 when you became a member of the Glendale City Council that you kind of shifted careers? Yeah, I came to Los Angeles in 1992. I moved into the 30th District in 92. And before that, I was living in New York City working for HBO and other film companies. And I moved out because I got a job at Paramount Pictures. So I worked in the industry for over 20 years, uh, worked my way up from being a script reader and an assistant to being an executive, a development executive and a producer. Oh, that's fascinating. And I'm sure a lot of people listening would think, why, why that shift? You went from the bright lights of Hollywood to, well, what can sometimes be the dark side of politics. So I am fascinated by politics. What inspired you to just make that change? Because even the most virtuous people, because it's it's kind of can be conceived as a a thankless vocation. So what inspired you? I moved to Glendale in 2000. We bought our, our house, our first and only house in Glendale. And I have been doing a lot of volunteer advocacy around L.A., And I volunteered to be on a city commission in Glendale, you know, a non-paid volunteer commission job. And it got me watching my new city more closely and being very interested in how it was developing, how people were living. Was it meeting people's basic needs? And I thought that one day in the future, when I was done with my career, I would run for city council. And I was diagnosed in my 30s unexpectedly with breast cancer and went through a year of treatment and decided that, well, I realized that you can't wait. If you wanna do something in life, you don't know how much time you're gonna have. No one's guaranteed right. 80 years or 70 years, and you need to you know, seize the moment, as they say. So I decided that year to run for council and became, I believe, only the fifth woman to serve on Glendale's council in over 100 years of the city's history, and came into office, and a few months later was able to cast the deciding vote to forever ban the selling of weapons of guns on city property. We had the last remaining gun show in LA County on city property directly across from our community college. And after we had one of those horrific school shootings, um, you know, luckily not in California, uh, we said enough is enough. And because of me com- my coming onto the council, it enabled us to, you know, get rid of that gun show. And we still sell, there were still gun stores in Glendale, but I, I didn't want to wake up if there was an atrocity in California finding out that Glendale had had a hand in the selling of that weapon. So I, after I did that, I was hooked. And so I continued doing my work. But as, when the seat opened up in 2000, oh, and I forgot to say the most important thing that I was able to, we were able to become a family through adoption. I lost my ability to have a child through my cancer treatment, but we went through many years going through the foster care system. And it's a whole other story. Um, but we adopted a child, and I see all of my work through the lens of what she's inheriting. She's 11 years old now. When the seat opened up in 2016, I said, you know, we all want to protect our kids, and the way that I feel I can make the biggest difference is by going into the state legislature. Ran for that seat and have been there for eight years, and very, very proud of the record that I've had in sustainability, on pushing back against climate change, on making our communities more resilient to wildfire, and primarily working on housing, which is the biggest issue we have locally, working to, to protect tenants, bring down the cost of rent, but also to add m- more housing so that we have enough housing supply to meet everyone's needs. I got to say, and I introduced myself before we started recording, I'm from Orange County, so it's not about which candidate I'm going to back, but I think you and I would be really good friends, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Such a pleasure to meet you. And that's what I was going to ask you as well. So you talked about some of your more 
proud moments um, as you began your career in politics, but it can still be rough. And I feel like you put a target on your back. As I shared, I was interested in, in politics, but I don't know that um, I could face some of, I guess, the cruelties that come with it. So share with us some of your other wins where you go, that's why I do this. People can be really cruel, and unfortunately we've lost a lot of the civility that I think we used to have of being able to politely and disagree with each other. Uh, people seem to go from zero to 100 in a second, and uh, that's unfortunate because there's a lot of yeah. important policy we should be able to have reasonable discussions about. I'd say some of my proudest moments were having Republicans stand up and speak in favor of some of my most controversial legislation. Some of the biggest bills that I've been able to get done were done on a bipartisan basis. Bills around housing and opening up more avenues to build housing. Uh, legislation around banning toxic chemicals from personal care products like makeup and shampoo. Getting PFAS out of children's clothing. That's a cancer-causing chemical that's polluting our water that's been routinely used to soak children's clothing um, and children's mattresses. To have Republicans stand up and say, I don't want fiberglass in my mattress. I don't want my kids' chemical clothing soaked in chemicals. I don't want to have dangerous chemicals in my skin lotion. And to be able to have bipartisan support for things that people thought were difficult or even impossible, that makes me proud and it makes me hopeful that if I can do it in California, maybe I can bring a little of that to the federal government. I love it. Now, help me out here, though. These seem like such basic things that everybody would be for. And you said it's difficult if not impossible, why? Why is it so difficult? Do people just not have the political courage to take some of those things on? Sometimes it takes a while for people to realize that something is really bad for people and that we have to stand up, sometimes against industry, and yeah. say, no, you can't use this chemical anymore. We're not okay. going to allow for study after study to hide something that's been clear to scientists for many years. Yeah. Um, and change is hard, especially when you have groups that are very entrenched you know, people who are used to doing things a certain way, it's hard sometimes to say, hey, there's a better way to do this. Absolutely. And sometimes you have people who have different perspectives. And a lot of times with, with issues, whether they're local issues around development or issues around toxic materials, people do have valid perspectives on every side. So it's not always the case that one side is wrong and evil and the other side is right and good. Sometimes you have to say, look, there's valid arguments on both sides, but the weight of the evidence or the people that are being harmed is just greater on this side. And even though some people are going to be upset about the decision, it's worth doing because it's protecting real people here in California. And I, the, you asked about satisfaction. The biggest satisfaction for me is knowing that I did something that was hard and maybe even pissed some people off, but that a lot of people are going to be helped by it. There's no better feeling than feeling that you've made a difference. And having people later come up to me and say, you know, I've done a lot of work for foster youth. It's not controversial, but it, not a lot of people are doing yeah. it. I, I, if you don't have a sec, I'll just tell you. I, I went I to an event. I nothing but time. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, settle down. Let me tell you a story. You know, I went to an event. I did an event in San Diego. And there was a woman there that nobody recognized. It was a young woman. And, you know, she had paid her $25 to come to the event. And she walked up to me and she had a book. And she said, I just want you to know that I've been in foster homes my whole life. And when you did that bill back in 2017 that allowed me for the first time to use what was supposed to only be money for my, my housing with the foster family, and you let me move that over to use it for college, I was able to go to college when I wasn't able to before. And so much of the work that you've done, she was speaking to me, has helped foster youth. And I wrote this book, and I want you to have it about my experiences, and she autographed it to me. And that sits right now you know, in my my shelf proudly. That's the kind of thing. It's just one person. But she felt that I made a big difference. And that kind of thing will just, it makes everything worth it. Right. And when people take the time and find a way to come back and say, thanks, you made a difference. Wow. More people than you would think do. I get letters all the time and emails from about my staff. Mm -hmm. Some During COVID, when people had so much trouble getting unemployment insurance here in Los Angeles, because we have all these entertainment industry people, they don't work a typical nine to five job, and our unemployed EDD didn't know how to deal with them. And we spent, my staff spent a whole year just dealing with EDD. And when someone would write me and say, hey, Victoria in your office took extra time to help me with my case and got my problem solved, and I just want you to know that she really helped me, 
that's not me necessarily, but just taking the time to do that, it brightened her day. It made mm -hmm. me feel good. So anyone out there is listening, if anyone helped you, I don't care whether it's if it's public safety or a teacher, take a moment to write them that little note. It, it will make their their month, I promise you. Well, I really wish I did have all day because it's <laughs> been fascinating talking to you. And I am I know I'm supposed to wrap this up, but you talked a little bit about housing, housing affordability, the homelessness crisis. I know they are top priorities for you. So what will you do as a member of Congress to address these issues? Yeah, so I want to keep working on housing because we need a lot more support to bring down the cost of rent, to add enough housing that we need to protect tenants in place and to, to be able to make sure that we have a bed for every head here in Los Angeles. And that absolutely means getting homeless people off the streets and getting people who need mental health treatment access to that treatment that right now is not really available for most people. So that means bringing resources here into Los Angeles. I've done a lot of work. I chaired the Transportation Committee in the Assembly and making sure that we have better public transportation so that people who are transit dependent, our seniors, our students, low-income workers, you know, trying to get to their job and bring their kids to school so that they have a better quality of life and that those of us who maybe want to be able to take public transportation to get to LAX or to get to a museum or to get to LA Live, have a safe and convenient way to do it without being stuck in traffic. That's another goal of mine, um, to make sure that we protect our basic civil rights, like the right for a woman to access abortion, the right to for the people to access health care, which is something else I've worked on a lot in my time in the assembly, so that nobody has to have their go into to debt over a medical bill or have their house put a lien on it because of unpaid medical debt that they can't afford, That's a, that should be something that doesn't exist in this country. So I got a lot of goals for Congress, and I just can't wait to get there. Bravo. Laura Friedman, thank you so much for your time today, and good luck in your race running for U.S. House of Representatives in California's 30th Congressional District. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.